Okay, welcome to everybody. It's a pleasure to have you around. Today we are going to, to make a, a very special exercise because those are things of modern times. We are going to make a defense of the PhD with three members of the jury. I will be the single one here, and the two others are very far away in the Pacific Ocean. One, uh, Bob Reed, is in Hilo, in the Big Island in Hawaii. He is working, he's this guy. <laughs> he's working to the federal uh, US administration and deals with the, uh, with the conservation in uh, several places in the US, especially in Florida, in the fight against the Burma Python, and also in one with the fight against the Boy Guerrero Rusty Brownstone. And the second person, the secretary is this guy here. Chen, Chen is now in Alanya. Alanya is one, so also very far away. He's still on Thursday. And uh, he's also part of the United States Department of Agriculture. And he's also uh, working there with the fight against the Boy one. They are two of the, I would say, of the greatest specialists in in fight against introduce uh, snakes uh, all over the world. And I myself, I think you all know me, I am Jose Maria Fernandez Palacio, I'm a professor in the College of this University, and I will be the president to the thesis of Julian. The title of the thesis is called has to do with the with the invasion of the California king snake in Gran Canaria. And uh, it has been uh, supervised by uh, two colleagues of the CSIC, here the Spanish Research Institute. Uh, they are uh, Marta Lopez Darias and Manuel Nogales Hidalgo. Marta is today presently here with us, but Manuel is at home due to some uh, healthy problems. Julian, please. Okay. Thank you, Jose Maria, for the introduction. I will now proceed with the permission of the committee to uh, read my PhD, to present my PhD. So, <coughs> entitled in this case, The Pearls of Many Basic Snakes, the California King Snake in the Canary Islands. And uh, as Jose Maria said, it deals with the invasive snake uh, in, the, in Japan. So, um, invasive species are particularly concerning due to their impacts on native species, ecological uh, dynamics ecosystems, but also our health and our economy. Since nearly one-fifth of the planet is currently at risk of biological invasions, the, their management and the, the mitigation of their impact has been included among the IHA targets and the sustainable development goals. Managing invasive species is particularly important on islands, since these are biodiversity hotspots, uh, whose biota usually presents unique ecological and uh, <coughs> evolutionary characteristics, making them highly vulnerable to invasive species and particularly invasive predators. <coughs> Traditionally, attention has focused on invasive mammals. However, other taxa such as invasive snakes are also concerning due to their impacts on native biodiversity. So, <coughs> the rate of introduction of invasive snakes has increased globally in the past decades, leading to more than 600 introduction events and more than 100 established populations worldwide, which you can see in this map where uh, island populations are represented in an orange circle, <coughs> sorry, and um, mainland populations are represented in a blue circle. The bigger the circle, the higher the number of populations in that precise area. Um, I would like to bring uh, your attention to the fact that most of these populations actually occur in tropical and subtropical areas, which go from more or less this line to more or less here, and uh, which is coinciding with areas of high biodiversity value. All of these populations uh, correspond to a total of 35 invasive snakes globally, from which the most uh, studied are the brown tree snake, already mentioned by Jose Maria, the Burmese python in Florida, also mentioned by uh, Jose Maria, uh, but also the horseshoe whip snake, the vibrant snake in the Balearic Islands, and the common wall snake in Christmas Island. These species have caused the severe decline, but also the extinction of native birds, mammals, and reptiles alike. 
and it also has to have triggered a secondary ecological effects such as the destruction of plant uh, of animal plant interactions, uh, predator prey dynamics, ultimately leading, leading in some cases to traffic cascades. Overall, what they show is that invasive snakes can cause dramatic ecological effects. However, most of the 35 invasive snakes that I just mentioned are still completely understudied and their impacts are, remain to be known, which brings us to the case of Lacropensis California, the California king snake, the species of concern of this PhD. This species is native to the western coast of North America, which, as you can see here, where, as you can see here, it occupies a huge area. It has a huge distribution. And in this, in this distribution, it occupies all sorts of ecosystems. That is why the species is considered a generalist in terms of habitat. From the information that is available from the native range, I will present you the diet of the species. The California king snake consumes a broad range of prey, including other snakes, small mammals, but also lizards, which are particularly important in the context of this PhD to understand the impacts that I will mention later. The species is also uh, extremely attractive in terms of captive breeding, which is the main reason for its introduction in Gran Canaria. It was detected in 1998 after a mass release or escape event occurred in the eastern slope of Gran Canaria, or more precisely here, and which is this location actually. <coughs> and uh, from now on in the next slide, I will present you a timeline of the invasion along with the map, this map, showing the progress of the invasion in the island. Uh, pay attention to these uh, icons because when they turn orange, that means that a new population was found, a new established population was found in the island. So the species was declared naturalized in 2007 after the detection of hundreds of individuals, not only in the original population, which was here, but also in other places of the island, several kilometers away from the original population. This caused social distress, but also led the government of the Canary Islands and Galindo de Gran Canaria to start a control program executed by the public enterprise test plan, and that is still active nowadays. Two years later, a second population was discovered in the north of the island, a second established population was confirmed, 30 kilometers away from the original population. In 2011, management efforts were reinforced with the approval of the Life Lapropetis project, whose aim was mainly to reinforce management efforts, but also to control the spread of the species and potentially attempt to eradicate it from the island. This project lasted four years, finished in 2015, and gave place to the mandatory post-life actions funded by the government of the Canary Islands and Calido de Gran Canaria. With the very bad luck that the very same year, a third population was discovered in the south of the island, here. Three years later, a fourth population was discovered in the northeast of the island, here, near Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, the capital of the island. And the next year, the strategic plan to control, uh, to fight against the California King Snake started in order to reinforce management efforts once again, implement biosecurity protocols and also uh, support applied research. Despite all of the efforts that have been made to control the spread of these species, it has steadily and continuously increased its invasive range, as you can see in this map, and nowadays occupies more than 145 square kilometers on the island, and that are only the established populations. On the other hand, captures have increased year after year, and nowadays there are more than 30, um, sorry, 13 thousand uh, snakes captured in the island since 2009. Previous research showed that the invasive snake consumes numerous endemic and uh, native species, but primarily the endemic uh, Saudia of Gran Canaria, um, which represent in some cases up to 75% of uh, the diet of the snake in the island. This is especially interesting considering, uh, as you may remember, that in its native range, the species primarily consumes other snakes, which are absent in Gran Canaria but also small mammals, which in Gran Canaria are represented by two invasive rodents. Therefore, the bulk of the diet is represented by the three endemic uh, salvia of Gran Canaria, which, which are the Gran Canaria giant lizard, here, the Gran Canaria stink, and Bodger's small tickle. Nonetheless, a temporal analysis of the diet in the island, more specifically in the main population, revealed that the proportion of lizards that was consumed from 2012 to 2015 decreased to 60%, from 60% to 22%, whereas the reverse pattern was actually detected for the invasive rodents. 
Besides the importance of uh, the ecological meaning of this switch, what uh, this evidence was telling is that potentially the lizards were being depleted by the invasive snake, and then the snakes, the snakes had to switch their diet to the invasive rodents to continue to feed, basically. Despite these insights, there were no studies previous to this PhD to uh, empirically assess the impact of the invasive snake in the native ecosystems of Canary. Therefore, research was urgently needed in order to determine the threat of these species in the native ecosystems of Canary. Consequently, four objectives were uh, determined, and uh, those correspond to the four chapters of this PhD. The first one, considering the heavy snake predation detected in Gran Canaria, was to determine if that had an impact on the abundance of the three species that I just presented. Since some of the individuals from these uh, populations could be surviving, the next step was to determine whether these presented differences in their phenotype or their body condition. Also, taking into account that uh, all of these uh, Sabria uh, have a huge ecological role in the island, the next step was to determine the indirect effect of their depletion, particularly on trophic cascades. And finally, the, next, the final step and the final chapter was to determine if these uh, impacts could potentially expand to other areas and affect other ecosystems of the island. Of the island sorry. So I will now begin with the first of these chapters of these objectives, which was to determine the impact of the invasive snake on the abundance of the three endemic salvia that I just presented. <coughs> As we have seen, invasive snakes had a huge impact on island um, vertebrates, including mammals, birds, and also reptiles, which have a crucial uh, role in trophic webs, but also in plant pollination and seed dispersal. This ecological relevance is due that uh, is due to Islands often lack of the organisms that in the mainland perform these kind of functions. Therefore, uh, these functions are performed by the island reptiles, which uh, in islands attain a high population density. This density, uh, in return, plays a crucial role for these species, these organisms, as it governs their reproduction, their survival, their natural selection, but also their importance in the ecosystems. In Gran Canaria, predation had already been detected for the three endemic species that I just mentioned. However, there were no indications of what were the consequences for their abundance. Therefore, the main objective of this chapter, as I mentioned, was to determine what was this impact on the abundance, and if happening, then what was the magnitude of this impact. To do so, to analyze this impact, three zones were selected, uh, which are, uh, well, which, which you can see here in this map, and uh, mainly overlapping with the three populations of the invasive snakes, the main populations in 2017. The north zone and the east zone were slightly more temperate and also more humid than the south zone. However, all of them were covered uh, with native scrublands with similar vegetation communities. Uh, in order to determine the number of sites that could be undertaken, first that was analyzed for the east zone, the bigger of all of them, and also the more complex, where native vegetation patches were interspersed with inhabited areas. Then, so in, to, in order to determine this number of sites, the number, uh, well, I mean, the snake records in this area, no more than uh, 300 meters apart from each other, were selected. Then a buffer of 200 meter radius was drawn around them. And uh, finally, a minimum complex polygon was uh, drawn around these points and their buffer, representing the invaded area in the east zone. This invaded area was plotted against the aerial photograph to determine the number of sites that could be undertaken, considering that all of them had to be placed in accessible areas, but also no, no less than 100 meters away from each other. The same number of sites was actually extrapolated to uninvaded area, and the same proportion of sites per square kilometer was then used to calculate the number of sites in the north and the south zones. Um, just well, now that I have the map in front of me and uh, that you can see it, uh, just mentioned that invading sites from now on on all maps and all graphs are represented in orange and uninvaded sites are always represented in blue. So all of the uh, sampling sites were divided among three different methods, the first two being uh, spatially explicit capture, recapture and distance sampling in the case of Pelotia stellini, in the case of the endemic lizard. Uh, by the way, the number of sampling sites per method and zone is indicated here in these green circles. So the two methods were used to estimate the density of these species, 
And in the case of um, in, uh, of this, especially explicit capture recapture, this was performed twice a month from May to September 2018, from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and only on warm and sun day and sunny days when the species is found above the ground. Every session consisted in 60 minutes of trapping uh, using 15 traps baited with tomatoes and sardines, as weird as that can may seem, and um, placed every four meters away from each other in shaded areas to prevent lizards overheating. All the lizards were uh, photo identified and then the resulting data set was analyzed using the SEC package. In the case of distance sampling, these samplings were performed during the same period and in each occasion, a single observer followed a 60 meter long transect counting the number of lizards at each side of the transect line within a band of 20 meters. For the final data set, for some technical reasons, and that I'm going to spare you. Only the lizards within eight meters of the transect line were retained, and the final transect was analyzed using the unmarked package. The last of all the methods were active searches under the rocks, which were performed from uh, March to September 2019, uh, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., when these species are found under the rocks. And uh, each session consists in 40 minutes of active searches, uh, divided among the number of team members. Uh, just to mention that uh, all of these methods were performed by using or taking into account the abiotic conditions that were detected at that moment so as to correct the abundance or the density of the species. And in the particular case of Tanitola uh, Bukiri and Calcetes sexuinitus, the abundance was actually calculated using the linear regressions. So that later you will not see natural numbers, you will actually see the residuals from that uh, uh, linear regression. The abundance and the density of the three species was compared among invaded and uninvaded sites using generalized linear mixed models. I'm going to spare you the statistical details. However, for anybody that could be interested, the details will be here. And that will be the case for any statistical analysis. And then the abundance or density of the species was plotted against the snake records in a grid of 250 meter uh, per 250 meter grid cell size. So now the results. After more than 100 hours of trapping in invaded and uninvaded sites alike, only one lizard was captured in invaded sites, whereas in the uninvaded sites, a total of more than 200 were captured. Overall, that meant that the allotestinine was absent from most of the invaded range, uh, with the single exception of this lizard, which was captured in the southern zone. Obviously, this uh, meant that the, the density of the species was significantly lower in invaded sites, and as you can see in this graph, it was actually nearly zero. In the case of distance sampling, a total of more than 20 hours of distance sampling and uh, covering more than 25 hectares allowed to detect 22 lizards in invaded sites and more than 300 in the uninvaded sites. As in the previous case, the lizards were more likely to be absent from the invaded sites. However, after removing the zero inflation, after removing all of those sites that were uh, basically that had no lizards, the density was more or less similar, was statistically similar between invaded and the uninvaded sites. Nonetheless, there is a trick to this, which is presented in this map. In this slide, you can see the presence and the, abs and the absence of the lizards represented as, as empty or filled circles plotted against the, the number of snake records, which are represented from completely transparent to completely dark, meaning completely dark that a lot of snakes were captured in that grid cell. As you may actually see, the field circles are only present in the edge of the invaded area where the number of snakes is slightly lower, but also where the snakes have arrived later. In the case of uh, Calcida sexuinatus, after more than 100 hours of active searches in both invaded and invaded areas, a total of, uh, <coughs> of uh, slightly, more, slightly more than 100 schemes were detected against more than 600 in, in uninvaded sites. The abundance of these species was also significantly lower in the uninvaded sites. And with the same effort, a total of uh, 1,000 or slightly more than 1,000 geckos were detected in invaded sites um, versus more than 2,000 in the uninvaded sites. The abundance of these species was also significantly lower in the invaded sites. I will present you a similar map to that of uh, Elotia where you can see the distribution of the abundance of the two species represented in crosses and circles, respectively. The bigger the cross or the circle, the bigger the abundance of the species in that site, represented against the snake records, which are 
basically the same representation as before. As you may see, the bigger crosses and the bigger circles are found away from the core of the invaded area. That meant that in the core of the invaded area, the abundance of the two species was lower and slightly more abundant uh, when moving away from uh, the snakes were more abundant. Overall, these results <coughs> suggest that Anthropelis California has a huge impact on the three endemic uh, species of Gran Canaria, driving Galotia stellini to a reduction of over 90% of individuals in invaded sites and causing these species to be absent from most of the invaded uh, sampling sites. But in a lot of words, Lampropensis California is driving these species to local extinctions. In the case of Calcides exlineatus, the reduction is over 80%, and in the case of Tarentola Borgheri, it's over 50%. This is also a huge impact on the two species. The severity of this impact could be related to uh, Gran Canaria having no natural snakes, known at least up to date, no predatory snakes occurring uh, on the island from uh, naturally, previous to the introduction of Lampropetis California. Therefore, the three prey, the three species here, could potentially uh, have less efficient anti-predator behavior against this invasive prey. Although this would need to be empirically tested, it could potentially explain situations like this one, where you have a snake here and a pink over here, and as you may see, they are separated by this, and the skin doesn't do anything. So besides the importance that this has for the abundance of the three species, the direct impact it is producing on them, it also, uh, considering that these uh, three species play a, a relevant role in the ecosystems, but also abundance is extremely important for them, this could potentially lead to secondary demogra demographic <laughs> effects, such as source same dynamics or IE effects. And considering the, their importance in the native ecosystems, as I said, it could also lead to ecological side effects, such as, uh, for example, the increase in the abundance of the invertebrates, or the reduction or side effects on the predatory birds, or the disruption of plant pollination or sick dispersal. I will now begin with the second chapter regarding the uh, impact of the invasive snake on the phenotype and the body condition of the fish species. <coughs> so invasive predators <coughs> can cause direct or indirect impacts on the native prey. Um, and theory predicts that when the native prey fail to adapt to this new interaction, they are faced with extinction, which is usually related to the lack of evolutionary history with the invasive predator. Basically, they don't know what that predator is. However, they can also survive by means of exaptation, which are traits that have evolved on the completely different ecological and evolutionary conditions but that are still useful to face the impact of the invasive threat. They can also survive by means of phenotypic changes, uh, and morphological changes are particularly important in this context because they have a direct link to species fitness, but also because um, they can contribute directly to adverb predation. Predation, in return, takes place in three sequential steps that are called the predation sequence. The first one being that predator and prey need to overlap in time and space. If that happens, then the prey need to avoid the predator, for example, by detecting the smell of the predator and then avoiding that area. And if that fails, then the prey need to escape the predator in order to avert being consumed. Even when prey are able to break the predation sequence at any of those steps, they can still uh, face indirect impacts due to stress-mediated responses. This complex system has usually been studied from a single species perspective. However, invasive predators are usually generalist predators that are able to affect multiple species at the same time within the same community. Therefore, the question is, what would happen if this is studied from a community-wide perspective? Would all of the species have the same response or not? To respond to this question, uh, the, invasion, the invasion of the California king snake offers an adequate scenario since the species was actually uh, causing a simultaneous impact on all of the species of the herpetofauna and the, well, on the endemic herpetofauna of the Canaria community, causing different responses or slightly different responses in terms of abundance, but all of them related to a single uh, evolutionary factor, which is the lack of predatory snakes naturally in Gran Canaria. In addition to all of that, the three species present 
different morphology and ecological habits that overlap to a different extent with that of the invasive snake. So, for example, Galotia stellini and Galsiria seclinia are diurnal species, whereas Tarentola bolgeri is a nocturnal species, and Lampropeltis californiae is diurnal and slightly protuscular with some nocturnal activity sometimes. In the case of Galotia stellini, um, it's also a surface dwelling species, whereas Calcides sexuinatus is a fossorial skin, and Tarentola boycieri is a scansorial species. And finally, in the case of Lampropeltis uh, californiae, this is a fossorial predator. Finally, uh, Galotia stellini is a large sized reptile whose males uh, present particularly big heads. And in the case of Calcides sexuinatus and Tarentola boycieri, the two are relatively small sized uh, species. And all of these morphological measures are particularly important considering that Lampropeltis California is a predator whose prey selection is determined by game size and the size of the prey that they try to consume because they don't chew, they don't have that ability. In this context, the main question was what were the impact of the uh, California king snake on the phenotype and the body condition of the three endemic species? To respond to this question, 10 sites were selected in the eastern slope of Gran Canaria, here, again, orange invaded, blue uninvaded, and in each site that was visited once, only once per species, uh, these individuals here were captured during uh, this period using traps, using active searches, um, and all of the individuals that were captured were uh, analyzed, their morphology was analyzed using 16 morphological traits, are related to sprint, clinging, or burrowing ability. Sex was also determined by a hurting in the penis or by shining a, low, a light dorsally in the case of Tarantula Bolgeri. And finally, body condition was also uh, analyzed using the scale mass index and my prevalence and my abundance in the case of Galotia stellini and Tarantula Bolgeri, since no ectoparasites were detected for Calcidus exaniniatus. All these traits were compared between invaded and uninvaded sites using generalized linear mixed models. And uh, although I will spare you the details again, just one uh, thing for the morphological uh, traits, the log 10 SVL was used as a correction factor. So the results were that for Galatia stellini, only SVL uh, from all the morphological traits that we measure, only SVL presented significant differences. Males here are uh, being larger than females in invaded areas alone. <coughs> However, the two body conditions, or at least two out of three body condition indices, uh, presented differences in the species, the average of uh, male scale index being lower than that of the population and creating an intersexual difference with females that was completely absent from uninvaded sites, and also might be significantly uh, more abundant in invaded sites. In the case of Calcidia sassiniatus, many traits presented morphological differences, all of them related to limb and toe morphology. So I present to you three of them, all of them related to hind toe or limb morphology. Uh, the longest hind toe, the lower hind limb, and the upper hind limb, all of them being longer in invaded sites, as you can see here. And finally, the other two morphological traits that present the differences that were the upper forelimb and the longest for toe. In the case of the upper forelimb, um, a significant difference was detected as in invaded sites the limbs were longer and uh, were similar between males and females, whereas that was not the case in invaded sites, the females having slightly more uh, lower or shorter limbs compared to males. And in the case of the longest for toe, males had a significantly longer toes in evaded sites compared to unevaded sites. The single variable for body condition that we measured for this species also presented differences, males having a better body condition in evaded sites compared to unevaded ones. In the case of Talentola Bolgeri, females uh, were larger than, uh, females were larger in evaded sites compared to unevaded sites. Also, a difference was detected not another significant difference was detected between invaded and uninvaded sites in females. However, as you can see here, the average was slightly lower and was actually similar to that of the males. Here, a different as a similarity that was not detected, not detected in the uninvaded sites, where females had uh, a significantly lower uh, or shorter limbs compared to males. 
And finally, females had also a higher number of lambda in evaded sites. Regarding the body condition, as in Galatia Stellini, two out of three uh, of the measures taken presented differences as the scale mass index was significantly higher in the invaded sites for females, and uh, males presented more mites in the invaded sites. So taken together, what these results are telling us is that the direct predation by the Lapropetis California, uh, by Lapropetis California, is causing morphological differences in the three species, Carotia stellini, Calcidia sexineatus, and Tarentola bodieri. All the differences are uh, vary at least among the three of them. Carotia stellini could become one of the few examples of uh, extinction coupled with the lack of phenotypic changes. Although this is predicted by theory, there are a few examples of this actually in scientific studies. Uh, we detected morphological differences in SVL, however, this is a large sized species whose males present particularly big heads, which could prevent predation to larger individuals and therefore explain the differences that were detected in the invaded sites. And consequently, the differences that we det detected are more related to an alteration of the population structure rather than ad adaptive responses. In the case of Calcides exliniatus and Tarentola boetieri, the two species presented differences in limb and toe morphology, in the case of Tarentola boetieri, also the lamella. All of these traits being related to escape and avoidance, or the capacity of prey to escape or avoid predators, uh, which could potentially explain the slightly higher survival of the species in invaded range. In any case, the changes that we detected for the two species are more likely to bring a uh, uh, like related to phenotypic plasticity rather than adaptive responses. On the other hand, regarding body conditions, invasive predators can impact the body condition of the native prey through two ways, which are direct impacts or indirect impacts. And uh, this consists in, for example, predators consuming uh, those individuals that have a lower body condition and therefore being less able to escape in an efficient way and this causes an increase in the population average. In return, they can also cause stress-mediated responses in individuals that are not consumed, which in the end is going to cause a decrease in the population average. In Gran Canaria, the uh, two mechanisms, or at least evidences for the two mechanisms were detected, as Galotia stellini were thinner for their size in evaded sites, but also presented more mites, which is in clear line with indirect effects. In the case of Calcidesis lineatus, individuals were thicker for their size, in invaded sites, which is in clear line with direct effects. And finally, as it couldn't be otherwise, in the case of Tarentola boetieri, the two were detected at the same time in the same species. Basically, individuals were thicker and also presented more mites. In general, what this is telling is that more research is definitely needed in order to uncover the mechanisms that are uh, behind this um, result. But uh, the main idea is that invasive predators can definitely cause different responses within the same community of prey. I will now begin with the third chapter regarding the effect of Lampropentis California on trophic escape. So top-down effect by invasive predators lead native predators to decrease, to a decline, which often can cause their prey to rise and reverberate to uh, lower trophic levels. Uh, causing indirect effects that are labeled trophic cascades. These are particularly important on islands, as the lack of certain organisms means that island biota lack of the ecological redundancy that could potentially dampen these indirect, indirect effects. But also because island biota, as we have seen, uh, is particularly uh, vulnerable to the invasive predators. This kind of uh, impact has already been described for invasive snakes, as the extinction of insectivorous birds in Guam by the brown tree snake led to a surge in spider web abundance. Nonetheless, invasive snakes are also important or also concerning due to their impact on island reptiles, which have, as we have already said, a central position in island trophic webs. In spite of that, no studies up to date were made to determine what were the indirect consequences of reptile depletion by snake predation. The invasion of Lampropetis California offered an ideal scenario to actually test or evaluate this impact as the species is causing, as we have already seen, a decrease in the abundance or density of the three species com uh, composing the uh, community of the endemic Lampropetis Canaria, which in return consume a broad range of invertebrates. 
So a study was planned uh, in three sequential steps. Uh, the first one being to determine what were exactly the orders consumed by these three species in the study area, in the invaded areas. Then determine the abundance of the three species, of, this, of the invertebrates, sorry, and uh, relate the differences that could be found between invaded and uninvaded areas with the consumption by the endemic reptiles. It is important to have in mind uh, the, the, these three sequential steps because, for example, an increase in any invertebrate that wouldn't be consumed by the endemic reptiles couldn't be related to trophic cascades. It could be an effect of the snake, but not trophic cascades. So the main objective of this chapter was to determine uh, the existence of a trophic cascade in Gran Canaria or not. To do so, first, as I mentioned, the diet of the endemic reptiles had to be studied in this study area, and to do so, the same undivided sites from chapter 2 were visited again in May, August, and November 2019 to capture the, the three endemic uh, species of the endemic reptile fauna of Gran Canaria and retrieve fecal material from all of them. Once in the lab, fecal material was combined per species, site, and season using these ratios, which are shown here, and uh, for a total of 200 milligrams per sample. All samples were, were then analyzed using the DNA stool, uh, the ESNA stool DNA kit, uh, and DNA was quantified using the DSDNA qubit assay. Samples were then sent to all genetics for subsequent metabarcoding analysis, including uh, first making the PCR mixes with these components and two um, primers that had been used in previous research. These were, were used in DNA amplification, and then the samples were put through a DNA sequencing and bioinformatic protocols to obtain a single taxonomical assignment for each read, up to the level of order. Only a couple of orders were retained for the final dataset, which was sent back to us and analyzed to obtain two metrics that are commonly used to describe um, animal diet, which are the relative rate abundance and the percentage of occurrence. From these two, a third metric was actually calculated, the MIDI, the Modified Index of Relative Importance, which was adapted from the original formula described in previous research of the Index of Relative Importance. This index was used to classify uh, the orders in high, moderate, and low consumption orders using this analysis, and the MIDI values were compared among these groups using this analysis. So the second step was to determine, as I said, the abundance of the invertebrates in the study area. And that was done by visiting again the same uninvaded sites plus the invaded sites from the stem to chapter two. This was done in May, June, August, and November 2020. And uh, for that, three methods were used as also. Three methods in order to obtain a better representation of the invertebrate community. The first one was pitfall traps. Uh, which was uh, used following a two-crop design using these traps here with these uh, dimensions that are shown on the screen. And the content of each trap was retrieved seven days later after they were disposed. The two other methods were uh, foliage beating and then sweeping, uh, which uh, were performed from, uh, by each researcher uh, following a transect similar to that of the traps and alternating both uh, methods so as to have a total of 12 feeding and sweeping in each site during the day and the same during the night. And each occasion was separated by at least 24 hours and only performed when wind speed was lower than 20 kilometers per hour. All the samples were then taken back to the lab and analyzed under the stereo microscope to determine archibald orders <coughs> and identify the abundance of each order. Then, the abundance of each order was correlated with the MIDI values, the consumption index, and also the orders were also classified uh, in high, moderate, and low abundance orders. Finally, uh, using the same analysis as before, the final step comparing between invaded and non-invaded sites the abundance of all invertebrate orders. And now, after all of this method section, the results. So the main question, the main thing for the reptiles diet is that we detected a significant or substantial seasonal variation in the three indices used to describe the reptiles diet, their relative rate abundance, the percentage of occurrence, and the modified index of relative importance. In spite of this variation, Imenoptera, Emiptera, Diptera, and Coleoptera were the four orders ranking higher in all of them, in the three indices. And actually, were the orders composing the high consumption group. This group had 
significantly higher media values compared to the low consumption group. And however, um, the moderate consumption group, which was composed by Lipidopter and Cifentoma, had similar values to the other two. Regarding invert rate abundance, there was also uh, substantial seasonal variation either in invaded or unevaded sites. However, Imenoptera, Aranea, Niptera, Entomobriomorpha, which is an order within Colembola, Coleoptera, and Diptera, uh, were the orders ranking higher in higher places. The high abundance group was only composed by um, uh, Imenoptera, and the moderate abundance group was composed by Aranea, Entomobriomorpha, Coleoptera, Diptera, and Emiptera. These orders pulled together presented significant differences with the low abundance group. And finally, the third step, and the most important one to determine the trophic scales, um, the invaded and uninvaded people sites presented significant differences in the abundance of, and this is important, only the highly consumed orders. The, consume, the orders that were highly consumed by the endemic reptiles. These differences were found in the case of Diptera, both all throughout the year, but also seasonally, and in the case of uh, Coleop and the same was actually found for Coleoptera, Emiptera, and Imenoptera. These differences were found in Diptera in November, and the same for Emiptera and Imenoptera, and in the case of Coleoptera were found in August. All of the orders being significantly more abundant in invaded sites compared to uninvaded ones. Similar differences were also found for one moderately consumed order, which was Lepidoptera, and two low consumption orders, which were Entomopiomorpha and Aranea. Lepidoptera and Entomopiomorpha being more abundant seasonally, whereas in, the case the dif whereas in the case of Aranea, the differences were a bit more subtle, spider abundance remaining high for a prolonged period of the year compared to unevaded sites, where the decrease, as you can see here, is more steep, steeper. And finally, as, um, <coughs> in the case of feeding and sweeping, the differences were slightly different, uh, varied a little bit compared to before uh, sampling, as only Mantodea was significantly more abundant in invaded sites, whereas in the case of Diptera uh, for sweeping, uh, this order was more abundant in uninvaded sites, <coughs> Emiptera was more abundant in invaded sites for a prolonged period of the year, and finally, Disanoptera was more abundant in unevaded sites during June, but the reverse was actually found in August. What are telling these results? Well, there is actually a trophic cascade in Gran Canaria uh, caused by uh, the depletion of the endemic reptiles uh, by El Anthropetis California predation, then that is affecting the orders that are highly consumed by the three endemic species, causing an increase in their abundance of, on average, 20%, but reaching in some cases as Emiptera as much as over 80% in their abundance. Considering the rapid expansion of the species that we have already seen, but also that trophic cascades can spread across geographical and temporal barriers, uh, these results make uh, clear once again that Lampropetis California is a serious threat to the native ecosystems of the island. And more importantly, or at least also importantly, um, Considering that some orders are also significant pathogen vectors, but agricultural plagues also, um, Amplopetis California could um, start to be conceived as not only an ecosystem or an ecological threat, but also a socioeconomic concern. And a side contribution of this study was that a new index for the representation of animal diet was uh, determined. Usually animal diet is studied using the relative rate abundance and the percentage frequency of occurrence, the first one being more precise but affected by radiological and methodological factors, and the second being more conservative but less precise. The second one was actually calculated for the study to obtain the mean values and produce exactly the same results as the percentage of occurrence which was actually shown in this presentation. Therefore, the MIDI index allows for a combination of all previous metrics that were uh, used in genetic studies to uh, determine an animal diet and allows this for, with an easy formula and also um, allowing for the incorporation of prey volume, which hasn't been used so far in metabarconic analysis for animal diet. I will now begin with the fourth chapter. regarding the potential distribution of Lampropetis California in the Canary Islands. So, as we have seen in the previous chapters, Lampropetis California is leading to a substantial or a severe 
population decline or even the extinction, the total extinction of the endemic saudia other in Canada, also affecting their phenotype and body condition and leading to trophic cascades that are increasing the abundance of the invertebrates in the native ecosystem. Considering the importance of these impacts, there is a need to determine if this could affect other islands and also other ecosystems of the islands. This is especially important considering the climate change that is affecting the islands, and especially because climate change is expected to modify the introduction pathways of endangered species, increase their establishment rate, and also their expansion, ultimately increasing their impact on the native ecosystems. Nonetheless, these predictions are severely biased, and actually uh, invasive reptiles are usually underrepresented in all of these uh, predictions. Therefore, any management strategy aiming to use these uh, evidences would need specific insights for this species in particular. Therefore, the main aim of this chapter was to determine if the climatic conditions of the Canary Islands were suitable for the species in order to establish in other areas under the event of its introductions. Of, of its introduction. So to do so, first, environmental variables were detected, were downloaded for the native range and the invasive range, uh, and uh, these were downloaded at 0 for 0 0.5 minutes, uh, which is similar to one square kilometer at the level of the equator. These included 19 climatic variables at current conditions and also predicted by mid-century using two different climate change scenarios. The RCP 2.6, where the carbon emission would finish in this century, and a far worse scenario where the, uh, the RCP 8.5, where the carbon emission would continue to increase up to the end of the century. Additionally, a topographic layer was also downloaded from, uh, for the native and the invasive range. And along with that, the presence data were also downloaded for the native range using GBIF, HerpMapper, and the data from the co authors. These were trained to remove imprecise records that were, for example, falling in the sea or outside of the native range, and resampled one square kilometer to increase the efficiency of subsequent models. In the case of the invasive range, the snake records that were downloaded, sorry, provided by Hespilani, were plotted in Gran Canaria, uh, and Gran Canaria was divided in a grid of one square kilometer with cell size. Then the number of snake records per year from 2009 to 2019 was analyzed using these two tests to retain only those uh, snake records that represented established or incipient populations and remove only anecdotal introductions. Subsequently, to remove or pre to prevent model overfitting and multicollinearity, environmental variables, which were very numerous, uh, were studied in order to determine their correlation and their variance inflation factor. Only those that presented a correlation below 0.7 and a variance inflation factor below 5 were retained for subsequent analysis, which consisted in four different models performed with four different algorithms that were GLM, GAM, MathSense, and Random Forest, which were repeated 10 times using 10,000 pseudo absences drawn within 200 kilometers of the presence of the species. Then, for each model iteration, the model accuracy was determined using the CBI and the model overfeeding was analyzed using the AUC diff. Additionally, the average model, uh, the average algorithm uh, accuracy was also analyzed using the CBI for only the invasive range. The best modeling algorithm was used to differentiate between uh, favorable and unfavorable areas where the species could thrive or potentially not, and to compare the climatic suitability uh, among all of the islands uh, using this test. I take the opportunity to mention that this is a climatic model, so I will only uh, talk about climatic suitability, not habitat suitability. And uh, since species distribution modeling is sensitive to uh, ecological novelty in the projected range when projecting the suitability to other uh, areas for temporal uh, scales, then uh, to prevent any ecological novelty or to detect if this, happened, this was happening, Current conditions in the native and invasive range were pooled and uh, compared to the conditions predicted for the Canary Islands under the two climatic scenarios to detect if this was happening, if there was an ecological model. Then, the best model for Lampropeltis California was reprojected to the future using uh, three uh, global climate models and two climatic scenarios that I already mentioned. Then, an average was calculated for each of them 
and the climatic suitability was compared with the current conditions to determine the increase or the decrease and calculate the number of cells where this was, where was this happening. Also, climatic suitability between current and future predictive conditions were compared using this test. And finally, the favorability threshold was also calculated for future conditions in order to determine if this, how would the species range change in the archipelago. So now, the results. Um, in this map, you can actually see the climatic suitability of the Canary Islands uh, represented from red to blue, in gradient from red to blue. Red representing those areas where the climatic suitability is completely awful for the species, where the species is predicted to not uh, thrive, not being able to thrive. And the blue one represents a perfect climatic condition for La Tropentis, California. So I will give you a moment uh, to actually find the red area. As you can see, it's very tiny and it's here in uh, high elevation areas which are uh, above, well, over 3,000 meters above the sea level. The rest of the archipelago is mainly blue or bluish. Actually, in all of Gran Canaria and more than 99% of the archipelago was favorable to, uh, to climatically favorable to the invasive snakes. And the average, uh, well, the climatic suitability for more than 80% of the archipelago, including Gran Canaria, was over 0 0.9. Climatic suitability reaches a maximum value of 1. So, yeah, pretty bad. Um, on the other hand, despite Gran Canaria was uh, completely favorable to La Tropentis, California, it was not the island with the highest climatic suitability, that being Fuerteventura, followed by Lanzarote. And also, uh, Indiana La Gomera uh, produced or had climatic suitability values that were similar to that of Gran Canaria. Now, regarding future predicted conditions, this is also a map representing uh, a gradient, in this case, not of the climatic suitability, but of the increase from 0 0.16 to more than 20% increase of climatic suitability in each red cell. As you can tell from this gradient, there was no decrease. Actually, all of the cells of Gran Canaria, of uh, sorry, of the Canary Islands, had a climatic suitability increase, and this increase in some cases reached as much as more than twenty percent. And actually, in the two climatic scenarios, both of them, either the bird one or the, or the worst one, had an increase in favorable area to one hundred percent, so that not even the high elevation areas would be saved from the from the land of Brazil, California. Uh, in the event, under the event of its introduction. All of the archipelago was favorable to the invasive snake. So, the Canary Islands are extremely suitable to uh, La Propentis California in terms of their climate, with the single exception nowadays of uh, the high elevation areas, where the average temperature is lower and the seasonality is high. This is in clear line with the results for other invasive reptiles, whose distribution is limited by low temperatures and high seasonality. Nonetheless, climatic, uh, the climate change that is affecting the islands uh, will make the archipelago increasingly suitable for the invasive snake, including the high elevation areas, and particularly in the high elevation areas, because uh, temperature and the seasonality have been increasing in the case of the temperature and decreasing for seasonality in the past decades in the archipelago, and this is affecting particularly the high elevation areas. In spite of all of that, it is important to have in mind that this is a climatic uh, scenario, a climatic model, and therefore other variables could potentially affect the distribution of the snakes, such as uh, vegetation structure or the availability of prey. In order to have more accurate predictions, um, future research should definitely delve into the consequences of these um, variables or parameters into the distribution of the invaded snake. Nonetheless, it is, uh, these results also tell us that tropical and subtropical areas represented within these two bands uh, are highly suitable for invasive reptiles and also invasive snakes. And this is highly concerning because these areas contain most of the biodiversity hotspots, which are represented in red here in this map. Therefore, and also, these areas are expected to have to suffer a great deal from climate change. Therefore, there is a need for further attention for these areas, which actually contain, as you can see in this map, 
most of the established populations of invasive snakes represented in blue in the mainland and orange in the islands. So I will now present some ideas as a general discussion of this uh, PhD. Um, research is a crucial asset in the, fight, in the fight against global change, but also in the specific case of invasive species, as it can uh, generate social and political awareness, uh, in help in building support for management, increase um, or aid in the development of management strategies, and also allow for a better evaluation of conservation actions, all of which can directly contribute to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal number 15 from the 2030 Agenda. This PhD and the research that uh, contained it uh, is a clear example of the indirect benefits of research on invasive species as it was performed in a scientific management joint context uh, bringing together the two spheres. Also, the results of this PhD and the associated research created social awareness about these invasive species by means of the press, but also political moment for the approval of the strategic control plan, which increased engagement and funding for management efforts. Finally, these results are also uh, highly important considering that most of Gran Canaria is connected not only to the rest of the islands of the archipelago, but also more than 100 countries around the world. And some of them are actually uh, in the Mediterranean basin, which is highly suitable for the invasive snake. The question now is how could research contribute in the future to the fight against these invasive species? Well, considering the general recommendations in the fight against invasive species and invasive perfect fauna in particular, um, there is a clear need for increased prevention and biosecurity in the archipelago. <coughs> And uh, research can definitely uh, aid in this, in this matter. It could also help in the impact mitigation, considering that Gran Canaria, most of Gran Canaria is currently invaded, and there are no easy methods to get rid of these invasive species in the near future, at least. There is also a huge uh, contribution area regarding the direct management of the invasive species itself, as uh, research could definitely help to increase the uh, management efficiency. And finally, considering that the impacts that have been found in this uh, BHC only represent a fraction of all the impacts of this uh, snake, uh, research could definitely aid or help in identify more impacts of this species, not only ecologically, but as, as I already mentioned, also socioeconomically. In spite of all of that, the results of this uh, BHC are in clear line with the results for other invasive herpetic fauna and also invasive snakes, whose impacts usually classify in the higher categories of the ACAT classification. In the case of invasive snakes, this is particularly worrying because invasive snakes have a, usually a very high trophic position, but also a high adaptive capacity allowing them to be present in most aerosol biomes. Nonetheless, their impacts are usually extremely overlooked or at least ignored because most of the snakes uh, occur in reduced distribution worldwide, also because they cause the aversion of general public, but also managers and scientists alike that have no arpetophonal focus, and because most arpetophonal invasions have been dismissed as inconsequential. I will now present to you the conclusions of this PhD. The first one being that Lampropetis California poses a severe threat to the, to the native ecosystems of Gran Canaria and the entire archipelago. Now, Propertis California is driving to a severe decline or even the extinction of the three endemic sauria of Gran Canaria, leading Galotia stellini to local extinction and Cancillas exquiniatus and Tarantula volcari to severe population depletion. The three species also respond uh, to the presence of or pollution by the invasive snake by presenting phenotypic changes and body condition responses. However, these responses vary among the three species. Lampropetis California is also responsible for a trophic scale, leading to an increase in invertebrate abundance in the native ecosystems of Gran Canaria. All of the Canary Islands, or at least most of the Canary Islands, are extremely suitable in terms of climate to invasive snake, and they will become, or are expectedly will become, um, increasingly suitable for the invasive snake in the near future, including high elevation areas. 
This PFC provides key insights on the impacts of the invasive snake, which can help to increase awareness about the species, build support, and design more effective management efforts. Finally, invasive snakes, in the light of these results, invasive snakes cause dramatic ecological effects, however, they have been globally overlooked. I would like to finish this PhD without, without addressing a few words of gratitude to all the institutions and the people that have, made me, uh, have been possible, have made possible for me to be actually here in front of you. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, these institutions here, the ASISI, the uh, Gobierno de Canarias, or the Government of the Canary Islands, Cabildo de Gran Canaria, Fundación of UVA and Transplant, provided key help in, during this PhD by providing lodging, support, uh, uh, lodging data, and many other things that made it, that made, made this research possible. And they were represented by Miguel Angel Cabrera, Ramon Gallo, who is here today with us, uh, Jose Sanchez, Jorge Sarrega, and Miguel Carmelo Amor. I would like to, and Fernando Navas, I would like to uh, address my sincerest gratitude to them. I would like also to um, thank Manuel Logares for his support during this PhD, uh, even when it was from the backstage or being present. Uh, I would also like the three uh, external reviewers of this PhD, Anthony Herren, Robert Reed, and Fred Krauss for their critical insights on this PhD. Dan Warren for teaching me how to do species distribution modeling. Elijah Rodriguez for providing self a place to work, basically, in Gran Canaria. I would also like to thank all the people that were involved in field work at some point uh, during any of the chapters that I just mentioned. Also, my teammates, some of them are here, actually, Alberto Lopez and Antonio uh, Perez, Tony, Daniel, and other, other people that actually uh, participated in the, uh, in the effort, I can't describe it, of counting tens of thousands of invertebrates in the zero microscope. And uh, actually, my biggest gratitude, I have no words for them, is for my team, Borja Cruzales, and my supervisor, Marta Lopez Arias, without whom this PhD wouldn't actually exist at all. I cannot even imagine a better team for all of the hard work we did, although I have to say that sometimes it felt like we were hardly working. <laughs> Thank you all also for being here today.